So I'm going to try to just make some, some points on a huge area that affects us all. I, I originally talked about this from a medical point of view, and still the talk will be heavily weighted that way because that's what I am. I'm a fam family physician and work at OHSU, and I've been there for close to 30 years. This August, I think, will be my uh, 30th year. And it's an interesting uh, journey with lots of challenges and a lot of uh, growth in myself as I've had to face some of these issues there. I want to call attention to the fact that, uh, you know, Dr. Benz, who was in the room earlier helping set up chairs, I don't know if he's still there. Are you still here, Chuck? Uh, yeah, he's over hiding in a corner. But, you know, he, he is actually in many ways more courageous to me, even in a Catholic system in terms of, uh, so these are relevant. You've got at least two people in the room have had to deal with uh, trying to practice conscientiously. And then I'm going to, as I'm, the points I'll make here today, I want to cover some of the background issues and then go on, uh, just open them all up. Um, current issues, because there are a lot of them, and it seems like every week there's a, there's a new one. Case reflections, principles, and discussion, but I, it's not something that's uh, just in the medical world here. This uh, is in Canada, and this is Cardinal Thomas Collins. And basically what uh, Cardinal Collins is pointing attention to is Canada's Supreme Court has really turning doctors into agents of death. And the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario, and that's the right way to say it, it's the CPSO, is literally wanting to force doctors to have to refer. And I want to get into the concepts of referral and is that cooperating with an evil or not? Because in many cases in my career, half my career, I was confused about this subject. I parked my faith at the door and I just thought, well, my first role is to be a doctor. And that is a confession I make right now that's totally wrong-headed. So as of the early 90s, I ceased doing things that I found were violating my conscience. And that creates somewhat of a flap, as you can see, um, in Canada, where now there have been five doctors suing the CPSO in Canada because this idea of asking me to cooperate with evil is wrong. And I'll talk about those principles in more depth. Uh, you all have heard about the pizzeria in Indiana. This is a young woman up there, right-hand corner, who basically is 22 years old. There was a videotape not done recently it was, it was taped they had in a reporter from Chicago quite a long time ago. And with this issue of, of gay rights, I put it in quotes, um, she dug it out and this relatively naive person said something very truthful. They would serve pizza all day to people who were of different um, sexual orientations, but serving at a gay wedding would not be something they want to do. This was totally blown out of the statement and the concept they were doing. And basically, um, there's been a national attack on the pizzeria that actually had to close. There's a boycott, there's hate mail, burn it down. It was literally, you know, it's almost like Ferguson. These are, these are real um, emails that they've gotten. It's so bad in terms of the vitriolic backlash, the failure to honor diversity, the diversity of a Christian pizzeria, or a, a pizzeria owned by Christians who didn't want to violate their integrity as Christians, that a gay couple in San Francisco, as reported in the Huffington Post, actually donated to the uh, crowdfunding that's now over $850,000. A gay couple recognized how unjust this is of not honoring diversity, if you will, and diverse points of view. So this is one of the silver linings. I want to be telling you that the world's falling apart. When you have people pushing the envelope for their, their sacred beliefs in what they believe in so much that they're willing to abrogate the rights of others, it's actually hopeful because it's waking up people, even people who disagree with maybe my point of view, our point of view on some issues, start to realize, hey, I thought this was supposed to be about choice. I thought this was about honoring diversity. And you're hearing me say those things over and over again because they're key principles for all of us who want to practice conscientiously with integrity in the United States of America. It was founded on the principles of independence and individual choice and, and individualism. Uh, so many safeguards. To, you know, federalism was defined as what was in the Constitution could apply to the federal government. If it's not specified, it was in the states. It was to decentralize the authority of kings and dictators. That's what we were founded on. That's what people died for is that principle. Even in a secular, uh, or at least in the sense of a, a country that understood that we had to respect different religions, and so in that sense it's secular, it's not, it's not identified with any one religion. I'm embarrassed because I'm a graduate of Notre Dame, you know, I, before I was in medicine I finished in aerospace engineering in 1971. 
Um, but he was invited, the leader of the country was invited to Notre Dame to um, speak. Now, I think that's actually good, by the way. I think inviting somebody to speak is honoring different points of view and exactly the principles I just said. I was embarrassed because they gave him an honor, besides speaking, of the Leitari Medal, which is the highest medal or, uh, uh, to a president who's the most pro-abortion president in the history of our country. I'll say it again, he's the most pro-abortion president in the history of our, our leadership. And that, to me, was a violation of integrity from my alma mater. I think there were at least 70 some bishops who wrote letters to Father Jenkins, who was and is the president of, United, of uh, Notre Dame. And he still was so absolutely dogheaded about his viewpoint that he still stands by his decision. Again, I have no problem with hearing different viewpoints. In fact, this is one of the points that I use when I talk to small groups or I talk to Medical Students for Life with a session they had in Georgetown a couple of weeks ago. And I preface my remarks with many of you in the audience, and they were, will not agree with some of the things that I say to you. That's okay. This is a university. I'm glad that you're here. And I respect that we will disagree. And I respect you. And I, I, I can even like you. Um, and I hope you can do the same with me because we're honoring diversity. I'm a minority about many of the views that I hold. If, if I were not here at Oregon Right to Life saying some of the things I say today, uh, it would irritate, not just um, bother people, would make them angry. And so I have to preface remarks with that. I, I actually say things to students in small groups that I, I want you to know that it's okay to disagree with me. I give evaluations. I give honors to people who disagree with me. It's okay. I, I give letters of promotion, support for promotion to my colleagues who do assisted suicide, to, who do abortions. I, I, I believe in talking about the issues of the person, even if we do, do disagree about life issues. So it's okay to disagree with me. You do have to respect people, and there'll be colleagues that you disagree with, but you want to be respectful of each other, even if we have different points of view. That's what universities are about. You wouldn't want me writing a letter of recommendation, on the other hand, that you've already made up your mind about issues and you're not willing to listen to other people's and you're closed-minded. That would not be very flattering. I say these things, it takes about a minute and a half because otherwise I get missile attacks for having a point of view. I mean, this is literally the, the, the climate we're living in. So he says, this is his content of his message. Let's honor the conscience of those who disagree with abortion and draft a sensible conscience clause and make sure that all of our health care policies are grounded in clear ethics and sound science as well as respect for the equality of women. Sounds good, next slide. Within months, or well actually it was several months before that, he put his then Secretary of Health and Human Services on gutting Bush's recommendation. And within a year or so of that presentation at Notre Dame, he rescinded most of the federal regulations designed to protect those who refuse to provide care they find objectionable on religious grounds. And you see that behavior throughout the last six plus years. So, you know, I'm 66 years old. I don't listen to words from people anymore, my, my kids or whatever. I look at their behaviors. And the behaviors of this man speak mountains to how he does not respect different points of view. He does not honor diversity. This is an apolitical talk. I'm talking about behaviors here, not parties. So what do some folks think in the United States? Next slide. The culture of death, ultimately human mentality. The fetus, given the opportunity to develop before birth, and given the essential early socializing experiences and sufficient nourishing food during the crucial early years after birth, will ultimately develop into a human being. Oh. So next slide. Who said this? Was it Margaret Sanger, the founder of Planned Parenthood? Was it Julius Caesar back in Roman times? Was it Peter Singer, the person who was not hired in spite of his views as a person who thought parents should have the right to kill their children up until one year of age? He was hired because of his views at one of our Ivy League schools, Princeton. Was it the Reverend Malthus who thought that we were like fruit flies in a bell jar? If you have too many people, we're going to run out of oxygen and food. He was in the 18th century, and this is what he believed. We're going to run out of food if we keep multiplying like rabbits. Was it John Holdren? Who's John Holdren? Well, next slide. Well, John Holdren is actually the president of Obama's science czar you know, section. He's also the author of Human Ecology, um, 1973, written by himself and Paul Ehrlich, Paul Ehrlich of the population explosion ilk, and it predicted massive famines which would kill hundreds of millions. Well, what's happened instead of their predictions, just like the predictions of Malthus? We aren't fruit flies. We have creative potential. 
In 1970, I remember going to a Rotary Club meeting and the people were lamenting, oil experts, that we're running out of oil and it's kind of sad. The United States is no longer an oil producer. That was their prediction. What are we now? We're the number one producer of oil in the world and gas, natural gas. And we argue over how to use these resources, not that we're running out of them. It's too dangerous to ship oil through a pipeline or too dangerous to ship it by coal. We argue about these things. And what's the difference between fruit flies and us? We have a creative genius that comes from having people who do things like split almonds. They set up cyclotrons. They, we do things that are extraordinary. Put man on the moon practically 50 years ago. It's, it's astonishing. We're not fruit flies. And so the idea of predicting the future, and if you want to go off on that thing, it's in 12 minutes you can learn more than three hours of talk by going to population.org and the section on the Population Research Institute that's out of Virginia with Human Life International. And they have these little stick figure cartoons and whiteboard kind of thing that explain what I couldn't explain in three hours so well because it's so well done. So what does it apply to us in medicine in terms of how do we actually behave and what, what code, what credo do we follow in the house of medicine? There are almost a million of us and we all don't share the same common beliefs. Well, in 1993, Pellegrino, by the way, when I was in Georgetown, I was blessed to be with, uh, with the head of the Pellegrino Center for Ethics, a true center for ethics that actually has an ethic. <laughs> I, I would be persona non grata at my own center for, center for ethics because I have a viewpoint about these things. They want people who are neutral on any boundary in life, which means that you have no ethic. I have an ethic. All human life is inherently valuable. That's an ethic. But when you talk about things like beneficence, that's not an ethic. It's a guideline to think about in deciding your ethics. You know, Is it worth it to give me a kidney? Well, at one time, we're putting me on dialysis. At one time, that was the committee decided. I didn't make the choice. Now, of course, it's routine. So the oath that we take now I'm at OHSU, we take a white coat ceremony oath, we take a graduation oath, and our oath is not the Hippocratic Oath. But in 1993, they said 43% of the oaths now vow for accountability for the physician's actions. Well, I hope so. 14% uh, prohibit euthanasia. Well, that's certainly not true in Oregon, it's not true in Washington, it's not true in Vermont. 11% invoke Aditya, we're down from, uh, you know, 100% were at least gods with a lowercase g uh, with the original Hippocratic Oath in Greek times, you know, and uh, it's, a, it's a unbelievable. 8% prohibit abortion. Merely 3% prohibit sexual contact with patients. By the way, it's not against the law in the state of Oregon to have sex with your patients. This is how lost we are. I don't think anybody would really think very highly, but it's not a legal issue. I think it's dangerous. But that was 1993, it was published in 97. I've seen no more recent study. It was one, one school that took the Hippocratic Oath, and it's not OHSU. So I'm there taking an oath. It's the uh, white coat ceremony, like I say, or whatever, and I'm taking an oath with somebody who does abortions, who does assisted suicide. He's already done, you know, a dozen or more. And we're taking the same oath. So what does it say about the oath if both of us can take the same oath? What does the oath say? That's correct. It says nothing. It says, I'll try to do good. Well, Kevorkian could say that. <laughs> Next slide. So the New England Journal uh, was giving a, a, a survey to 2,000 physicians just to see where your doctors stand on these things. 63% response rate, which is really quite good for a couple thousand doctors uh, to actually cooperate with something. Um, <laughs> they felt obliged to present all options. 86% of them did. So if it's legal, some of my colleagues think I have to present that because it's legal. 71% um, were just like I was for half my career, where I wouldn't do it, but I would refer for it. Most ethically say it's okay to describe the objection if they objected. Um, my patients often, not my patients, but some patients who come to me, because they don't remain my patients generally if they don't like what I'm doing, but the patients who come to me sometimes, I, I will tell them why. I will be reluctant sometimes to do it. I say, you know, I just don't do that, and I don't want to burden you with it. But, you know, some of them that intrigues them more. No, I really want to know. And, you know, it's very interesting. I remember one time a patient coming to me and wanted to have contraception. I, I stopped doing that in 1993, I believe, so 22 years ago. And I was really nervous when she first came to me. You know, and the first time I said to my front desk, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm not giving superphysiologic doses of powerful female hormones to human females because it doesn't enhance their health. 
and there's some religious reasons too, because I'm a Catholic. But she wanted to know, and the more I tried to not tell her, the more she said, no, I really want to know why you no longer prescribe that you did two weeks ago. I said, well, I'll tell you, but I, I, I was so nervous. I said, I want you to know, I, I, I'm not, this is my own decision, it's not to try to impose it on you. And No, I really want to know, tell me. Okay, so I went through the medical reasons, and I got to the third of the different mechanisms of which pills work, that suppress ovulation, to enhance the thickness of tenaciousness of the cervical mucus so the little fellows can't swim through it. And the other way because it thins the lining of the womb. Everybody knows that when you're on the pill, basically you have lighter periods, right? It's a way to regulate periods if you're an OBGYN or a family physician that does OB like I do. And as I got to that last mechanism, the lining of the womb would be thinner so that you know, the new conception wouldn't. And she said, she interrupted me, she said, well, you mean it would be like an abortion? I said, well, yeah, I wasn't going to use that word, but yes. And she said, I'm glad you told me I, I would never want to uh, do an abortion, have an abortion. And so, you know, I wasn't very uh, fearless at that time, um, and God doesn't give you more than you can handle at a time. So basically, uh, I, there have been some other tougher situations since then, but, but it's, it's a taking a step in faith. And by the way, what was I worried about when I, when I took this step in faith? I was worried about, could I make money? Because I was doing these things, and I made money from them. I was good at it. I had seven kids at the time. I was an associate professor. Could I even keep my job? If I don't do contraception, I teach residents and medical students, could I do that? And, you know, I took the step in faith and not only, you know, I was worried about money, so what does God do? I made more money that year than I ever had. <laughs> there was your answer. So they were bothered, though, um, about this in the New York, New York Times. Present all options and information, yes, 86, undecided, 6%, and no. Some people, like me, would not, when you're dying, would say, you know, we're in Oregon. Have you thought about assisted suicide? I would not do that. I won't do that. I'm unabashedly supportive of the health and well-being of my patients until they die naturally. If they don't want undue things done to them that are disproportionate to their care, I'm fine with that. You have choice. But I will not violate my own integrity. I will not give you a concern about the consistency of your doctor, the integrity of your doctor, the conscientious practice of your doctor with that issue. The New York Times was really upset. They lamented the fact, although the closed mouth doctors claim a right to follow their conscience, that they're grievously failing their patients. So this is a, the usual indictment. I'm abandoning my patients because I won't kill them. They seem to have forgotten the age old admission to do no harm. You see, we use the same principle. Doing no harm for me means I'm not killing my patients. Doing no harm for the New York Times means I won't kill them. Or I won't kill their baby. Or I won't help them to get to somebody who will kill their baby. They lamented 42% object to prescribing birth control for adolescents without parental approval. So I do want my parents. I'm, tomorrow I'm giving a talk, a father-son talk at, uh, at Providence uh, put on by Northwest Family Services because I want to bring the parent, the father, in contact with the son to talk about these very difficult to talk about topics, the parents there with them. That's taught in medical schools not to do it that way, to cleave the kids away from the parents. That's taught as the standard of practice. 52% opposed abortions for failed contraception. So this is also the connection between contraception and abortion. I know the Oregon Right to Life, National Right to Life, when I talk about abortion, and they really leave, unlike me, they'll leave contraception off the table. But you see the mentality. This is actually the Supreme Court of the United States in 1992. Since contraception is widely accepted and practiced in the United States, and because it fails at times, abortion is necessary as a backup. That was a legal discussion Oral arguments in 1992, Casey versus Planned Parenthood. An alarming 18% felt no obligation to refer to other doctors. We talk about the principle of referral. If I drive the car to the bank for the bank robber, am I cooperating with the bank robbery? I mean, it's, it's, it's breathtaking. I mean, if you talk about material cooperation, even the teller handing the money to the, the bank robber is cooperating. Now, in that case, it's actually okay to cooperate. Why? The, the right to life yeah. trumps money, at least in some healthcare systems. Um, <laughs> so tens of millions of Americans probably have such doctors, thank God, and are unaware of their attitudes. Well, you know, it's interesting because the ethics police came to my office one time. It's true. 
some nurse had complained because I went into a patient's room after OB, after she delivered, and, um, and I talked to her because she was going to have a um, tubal ligation. I said, you know, you have other choices. You can do this in six weeks. You don't have to rush through this. The procedure is really no more difficult. It'll actually save hospital days because you'll go in as a day surgery. You know, I said, or, you, you know, you may change your mind. And ultimately, she did change her mind. She decided not to have the tubal ligation. So the police, ethics police person came into my office and said, you know, some nurse complained about the fact you went into a room after delivery and you made the person change their mind. I said, well, I, I don't understand. Uh, did the patient complain? Well, no, but we're going to talk to her. I said, well, that's good. And um, who's complaining? The nurse. I said, well, how can I make somebody change their mind? I can give options and alternatives, but ultimately my patients have their own decisions in their own mind. Well, we'll talk to the nurse. I said, well, I'm glad if you do. And if you find that the patient, or I talked to the patient, I said, well, if the patient corroborates the fact that I gave her options and she changed her mind, will you also talk to the nurse and ask why she wanted this woman to have a tubal ligation? Was she too poor? Was she too black? Was she on Medicaid? Did she feel that she was not a good mother? What was the pejorative view that the nurse had? And of course, then she went on to say, well, I understand you, uh, you don't prescribe contraception. I had corroborated that, said so that's true. We said, well, what if people come to you? And I told her, well, I offer other options. I say there's no charge for the visit, but they still wasted their time coming to you, Dr. Toffler. I said, well, it hasn't happened yet, but I suppose you're right. He said, well, maybe we could solve this by putting a, a sign in your office that, um, that said what you do and you don't do. I said, well, that's actually a good idea. I think we should be transparent. I think it's such a good idea. Why don't we have everybody all the doctors put a sign in the office with what they do and they don't do. And she started thinking about that. Oh, I don't think we could do that. <laughs> Next slide. So the New York Times went on to say, any doctors who can't talk to patients about legally permitted care because it conflicts with their values should give up the practice of medicine. Any blacksmith in the South who thinks that they can't put shackles on slaves in 1863 ought to get out of the business of being a blacksmith because it's legal. I mean, think about it. How absolutely wrongheaded this is. Next slide. By the way, I got asked that question at Georgetown by somebody, you know, what, 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 what you, you got to refer. Referral's not doing it. Well, you know, if Caleb came to me with that slave and I, by the grace of God, understood the evil of slavery in 1863, or let's say 1857, before the Civil War, when it's totally legal, nobody's making a fuss about it. They only get three-fifths of the vote, I think, if I'm right. They're not really people. They're slaves. But by the grace of God, I understood the, the evil. And Kale, I, I'm sorry, I can't help you with that. I, I can't help you. I don't believe. In, what do you mean? What kind of a blankety-blank lover are you? I'm sorry. Well, is there another blacksmith around that you can let me go to? Are you going to help him? Are you going to show him the road? Are you going to lead him down? Tell him to take your horse? No. You can't do that. And this is, uh, it's, it's interesting how people get upset about it. There was another curmudgeon in the audience who basically said, well, if you don't refer, doesn't that place an undue burden on other people who are, gonna do, who are doing assisted suicide? We were talking about assisted suicide. And I let him finish this question. And I said, you know, it's an interesting choice of words that you use. I said, burden. I practice medicine. I like medicine. I, I like uh, teaching. I like talking to you. And we don't agree, but I, I like the interaction that we're having. You're very respectful. I appreciate your question. But why did you say burden? If it's such a great thing for people, if it's a gift to dying, if it's suffering, if it's death with dignity, why would you be burdened by it? You ought to be excited about it. And then beyond that, if you believe it's so important, <coughs> it's sacred to you, it's a sacrament to you, why are you trying to impose it on other people? I thought we honored diversity here. Remember that point I'm making? So you could hear a pin drop in there, and <coughs> he didn't ask any more questions. <laughs> Until after the talk was over, and we talked for about 20 minutes, and, you know, we shook hands. But it, it's, he was truly religiously convicted in the sacrament of assisted suicide. They're religiously convicted in the sacrament of abortion. They're religiously convicted in the sacrament of sexual orientation. If I want to marry three people, I'm religiously convicted in. I mean, what Father Tad said this morning about three people being involved in a pregnancy is true. In Thailand, there were three people who got married. Three same-sex attraction males. So here in OHSU, uh, this is actually, I'm not out of school. This is a published peer review article. In light of the potential harm to the patient, 
um, lack of informed consent, medical and psychological harm. Psychological harm would delay. Reasonable insists that a physician, thank you very much, who, with moral objections to the termination of pregnancy, there is that euphemism. My wife, you know, and I um, were blessed with uh, actually 14 pregnancies, seven miscarriages, but seven of them resulted in termination of pregnancy and we had babies. <laughs> It's abortion. It's interrupting the life of a baby. The whole euphemism is even termination of pregnancy is a euphemism. If you're not, if you're not gonna do that, though, you, you, you should um, provide abortion information if not the service itself. So you gotta talk about it. I do talk about it. I talk about the harms of it. I talk the connection of breast cancer like Angela Franchi is talking about today. I've learned a lot from Dr. LaFranchi or Joel Brind or people who've done research on the harms that we do now, it is possible to get breast cancer. I have a patient now who's had eight babies and she has uh, a cancer. It's not like it's only due to abortion, but it is one of the risk factors, at least if you look at world literature about that and you don't listen to the ACOG, the American College of OJOAN, who suppress that information of being told to women or suppress that you're more likely to be dead in a year if you have the abortion versus carrying it to term by a factor of four. Most of it's from all-cause mortality, including suicide. In fact, the British College of OBGYNs actually informed consent you should tell people or screen for depression. And by the way, if you have the dangerous thing like carrying a pregnancy to term, because we know all the risk of pregnancy, the likelihood of being alive in one year relative to a woman who's not pregnant is what? Because we know we have preeclampsia, we've got embryonic, I mean, amniotic fluid emboli, you've got all kinds of things that can happen you're actually half as likely to be dead in one year if you carry the term, in spite of those risks that I just talked about because they're so darn rare. And what do you do when you're pregnant that might make you safer? Increased healthcare utilization. You, you are seen every month by your doctor, absolutely, what else? Even in the days when seat belts were voluntary, you probably used your seat belt and your shoulder belt, you didn't do hang gliding, you didn't get on ladders and you know <laughs> clean off the roof, uh, the windows. There are a lot of things women do, they stop smoking, much easier to have a woman stop smoking than a non-pregnant woman stop smoking. You know? Pregnant women, will, why, do, why do they do it, by the way? They care about their baby. So you take care of yourself and your baby. So it is not a dangerous thing to have babies. It actually enhances the health of women. So my patient who'd had ba eight babies, it's a rare thing for someone like that. You've reduced the risk of breast cancer by 50% by just having a full-term baby. If, especially the younger you are, the better. So if a, this is my, the former residency director, OGYN in OHSU, she says, if a, such a physician, this is in print, she says, feels unable to counsel because of moral beliefs, he or she should consider a different specialty. So only doctors that would go into OB would be ones who do abortions, or at least refer for them. Is that the kind of doctor you all want? If we honor diversity, you'd have doctors like me who don't do that stuff anymore, and don't even refer anymore, is the point. At one time I was wrong-headed, misguided, ignorant of how I was violating a clear boundary. What is the Reverend Ragsdale of the religious, religious coalition for reproductive choice? There's a euphemism. I believe in reproductive choice. I had seven kids. I mean, come on. This is, <laughs> this is not the word. It's a coalition for aborting babies. She says that we believe in conscience, but if you can't provide the full range of services, choose another field. Next field, next slide, no, no problem. Bogoyevich, the former disgraced governor of Bogoyevich, he wanted to have the pharmacists down in southern Illinois do it. No delays, no hassles, just fill the pill, you know? And thankfully they won in court. The disgraced Bogoyevich watched that before he was disgraced as governor and run out of town because he was selling Senate seats. Kind of like some governor here a little closer, you know? Um, <laughs> something about... So in Massachusetts, the Walmart ph pharmacies, you know, came from a religious family and they weren't carrying contraception. And the state legislature, or the, the courts actually said, you know, a, a pharmacy board basically pressured them to do it. And now, of course, Walmart nationwide carries it in their stores. This is the problem with, um, now corporations, of course, aren't individuals, even though they're defined that way in law. And this is, this is where you've had controversy even more recently with the Hobby Lobby case next. But Walmart caved on this. Now, you do have protections. When I talk to medical students, there are at least four major protections that you have still, despite the current leadership. Um, the wealth in the men, you need to know, know about these because if you have people in the healthcare professions, they would really cost if you had an attorney general, of course we don't, that would actually prosecute these things. 
uh, both at the state level and the federal level. But you know, health and human services funds would not be distributed if you don't follow these rules that subjects individuals to discrimination on the basis of their, they don't provide, pay for, or provide coverage of or refer for abortions. This is the Weldon Amendment. Next, the church amendments. The um, provision also extends protections to personnel decisions, prohibits discrimination against people like me or other healthcare professionals in employment because the individual either performed or refused to perform an abortion. So either way, it's trying to protect diversity. If doing so, it would be contrary to the individual's religious beliefs. Now, the penalty for this, if, if you receive federal funds, you would have all your federal funds, all your grants and everything taken away. These are powerful tools that are almost never used and almost forgotten. And uh, of course, you know, the reason why they were totally forgotten is the current, you know, the leadership before was clearly in a different court. The public health service pre prevents discriminating against any entity that refuses, uh, that, that if the entity refuses to provide abortion training, you can't discriminate against them is what it's saying. If it refuses to make arrangements for such activities, they tried to do this at a residency level with OBGYN that you had to mandate that OBGYN residencies taught abortion, and thankfully they lost that. Um, so if the entity doesn't provide induced abortions, you still can survive. That's what it says. Next. What does the Affordable Care Act say? Well, I spent the last uh, 40 minutes of talking about this is unfortunately uh, no qualified health plan offered through any exchange may discriminate against any individual health care provider or health care facility because of its unwillingness to provide, pay for, provide coverage of, or refer for abortion. That's what the act says. What's the behavior? Everybody has to do it, even the little sisters of the poor. This is where we are. And fortunately, those cases are tied up and some of them still pending. Um, Hobby Lobby was one on four out of 21 contraceptives, but the reality is I would be against all 21 out of 21 from either a medical or religious point of view, personally. I have only one, it's called natural family planning, which is like, you know, it's interesting, we live in a state, I made this point last talk, I said, where we're all upset about GMOs, but we have no trouble with our daughters and our granddaughters taking super physiologic doses of powerful female hormones. There's clearly known risks from the latter, and there's theoretical risks to the former. No proven risks, there's a zillion foods that now have genetic modification to make the harvest more abundant, so you have more energy, more protein, more everything. The AMA policy, neither physician, hospital, nor hospital shall be required to perform any act violative of personally held moral beliefs. This is where uh, the AMA is actually on the right side of things, although they're pro-abortion. They used to be against abortion at one time. I'm no longer a member, um, because I, I don't like the stance they're taking on some things. They've actually been pretty good about some principles. Next, they're not on all though. They're actually lamenting because um, there really was a dearth of uh, providers providing abortion, thank God, but the reality is that um, they've got people stepping in to support the activity. One of the things that is true in my program is something called a READY program. It's an acronym for Reproductive Health Education, which is an, a euphemism for getting abortion training for family practice residents at OHSU and other places. The anonymous donor, I happen to know because I know the people who got the money, is Warren Buffett, one of the buddies of the Obama administration, uh, who owns a lot of railroads, who's making money from um, all the railroads carrying oil. Um, so you, why, you see now, why, why that pop pipeline getting blocked? Um, why did he say the rich people should pay more taxes when he, all of his subsidiaries are going to Canada to avoid taxes? I mean, you have to look at the behavior again, not the words. So they're, they're actually paying the rich people to not produce so many people in the world. That's Warren Buffett, Bill Gates, the Gates Foundation. These are billions of dollars they're contributing to suppressing population growth. And this is one of the diabolical, insidious ways that it's happening. Next. Um, the ACOG, American College, I've talked about them before. They, they had a letter to all those U.S. senators 10 years ago to require doctors with moral objections to refer for abortions. This is the state of our conscience protections and the organizations that are supposedly helping women's health. Next. The AMA policy, they're the AMA and on the wrong side of issues here. It calls on pharmacists to fill or, or help fill um, prescriptions for contraceptives such as the morning after pill. Next. We're conflicted, how do we decide? Um, next slide. So Martin Luther King had some profound words. We all rever him. It was just not too long ago we celebrated his um, his his an anniversary uh, 
And on some positions, cowardice asks the question, is it safe? Expedience asks the question, is it politic? Vanity asks the question, is it popular? But conscience, conscience asks the question, is it right? And there comes a time when one must take a position that is neither safe, nor politic, nor popular, but because it's right. Next. What does God have to say about this? Well, if you look at Ezekiel 3, when you do not warn nor dissuade an unrighteous man from his evil, he will lose his soul for his iniquity, and his blood will be on your hand. Yet if you do warn him and he does not change from his evil ways, he will lose his soul, but you will at least save your own soul. That's what we're called to do, is at least confront respectfully and lovingly one another on the boundaries. I remember doing this with one of my colleagues who did abortions, and he kind of looked at me patronizingly like, oh, isn't that sweet of you to care about me? And, um, you know, unfortunately he never stopped, and he was one of the chief promoters of assisted suicide as well, which shows where you go when you no longer take the inherent life of everybody as being invaluable. Next. So a little cartoon, it says for the people in the back, unless you take a trip to a state that has legalized all this stuff, uh, the book of rationalizing virtues, so Moses on the Mount with the Ten Commandments, yeah, you pay attention to these unless it's legal to do otherwise. Next. So these are the competing principles, and it's interesting, you know, when I talked at Georgetown about, about the ethics, in quotes, of assisted suicide, we use the same principles. For me, I want to exercise my autonomy as a physician to practice as I would, and patients who come to me can come to me because of that or in spite of that. But the patient has autonomy too, and certainly you have rights as individual patients. I have a right when I'm on the receiving end of care, like I was when I broke my pelvis a couple years ago. And, was my first hospital stay on the receiving end, and I, I certainly wanted to have a say in my care and how much opioid I got, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> that was my first use of opioids. Um, uh, I guess since I broke my wrist, that's right. Anyway, it, it was the first time I had, had some real doses. Integrity for the physician, I, I want to defend my integrity. I want you to have your integrity as a human with whatever you do. And for the patient is access, and if I don't allow access, I'm violating your right to access health care in the United States. That's what they, the other side would argue. It's my ethical right to have boundaries in my practice. Uh, I don't do foot binding in my practice. I don't do female circumcision. Some of my colleagues don't do male circumcision. I, I defend their right not to do it. I'm not promoting it or discouraging it. I don't feel it's the same ethics that it is about killing people, but that's my choice. You can have your own opinions about it, and I respect that. I don't care which way you are. You know, if the person wants to have a circumcision with their male child, okay, if they don't, Okay, I'm good at it, I teach it, I'll do it. That's not to me an ethical issue. For some people it is, and my colleagues don't do it. I respect them. I'm an independent agent. Oh, I got trained by the state of Virginia and I didn't have to pay much and I didn't. I'm almost embarrassed to say how low my tuition was at medical school. But does that oblige me to violate my conscience and do unethical things? This is their argument. I don't believe I'm doing harm. They believe I'm abandoning a patient. I'm, I'm abandoning a patient because I'm not offering the service to kill themselves. It's amazing that the Supreme Court of Canada just recently ruled in February that under the Constitution of Right to Life of Canada, people can kill themselves with doctor's aids. A right to life. I'm not making this up. <laughs> Nine nothing it was. Next. So the different ways we look at things, principles change in a democracy, and they do. Uh, AMA was against abortion, now it's for it. Um, a religious, no, they should continue to be against it, like they were when they were more reasonable about doctors not crossing lines. It's the benefit for the most. Utilitarian, Barbara Wagner couldn't get chemotherapy for her cancer that recurred. She could get assisted suicide paid for 100%. Give to the least in selflessness. So I defended my 98-year-old patient a week ago, eight days ago, in front of the legislature because I thought there should be a law in the state of Oregon that didn't discriminate what services, medical services you got based on age. Can you believe it? You actually have to go testify for such a principle in the state of Oregon? I'm not making this up. I had to cajole my colleagues to do a CT scan with him. I had to cajole my colleagues to operate on him when he has bladder herniating into his inguinal canal. Now these are good doctors, by the way, but they were concerned about his age. I said, he's really a strong fellow. He doesn't usually complain. Essentially, 
he's worth it. He got operated on two days later, he's out of the hospital. In three more days, he'll have his 100th birthday. You know? <laughs> Next slide. So this is what's happened. We're dominated by people who think principles change. In fact, I had to correct one of my evangelical colleagues because as he was doing Q&A in response to people asking questions about vaccines, he says, well, ethics change. I said, well, ethics actually don't change. We should change the language there. Principle, ethical principles, ethical principles don't change. But you can adjust how you apply them based on circumstances that change. That's true. But the principle doesn't change. If you start saying that, you're on a slippery slope. If you're talking about democracy, it sounds great. Well, 100 people around a tree about to lynch somebody is a democracy. They all say lynch him. Uh, 2,000 years ago, there were some people who said crucify him. I mean, that's a democracy. And democracy without principles is chaos. Religion's bad for democracy. You've heard that even from our president recently. Well, without principles, you have a chaos. You have a mob. The majority decides right. The lobbyists, the polls, you know, we had two people testifying for that last week, and the rest of the people were against it. Thankfully, they only let us testify because we were out of town. But the point is that, no, principles are immutable. There is a God-given right, inherent right to life, liberty, and happiness, pursuit of happiness. God given, it's not the king that gives it to you. And the king can take it away, like they did in China when they say you can only have one child if you, if you get a permit. They've softened it, now you have to get a permit for two children, you know, next. All right, so um, now we have even question mark about the ones that I didn't cancel here. Give to leaves and selfishness, well, you know, when we tried to defend against assisted suicide, we did focus groups and we saw that when you actually tried to defend the disabled, um, it didn't sell well with the crowds. Like, no, let them die. And literally, you have people ending life without explicit request, a thousand of them in Belgium. What is ending someone's life without explicit request? Murder. Yeah, that's the correct English for it, murder. <laughs> Next. But they come up with a euphemism for it, you know? So, yeah, this was actually local, and you have to give credit even some liberal reporters, because he has integrity. This is Peter Korn, and I didn't even know the ethics policy at OHSU had changed, but you know, it was known by enough people of my strange from Mars kind of stances that I have um, about things, and so he calls me up to ask me what I thought about it. And I think I, I, I had forgotten exactly what I said, but I, I said something, I'll, I'll go to jail before I'll do these things, you know, and uh, Toffler's a devout Catholic, practice guidelines dictated by his own moral core, trump the practice guidelines. So look, how do people respond to that? Next slide. So one person wrote in, next, uh, oh, th this is a picture of one of my patients, and she agreed to be photoed and put in the paper, Peggy Budge at the OHSU clinic. Toffler won't do abortions, assisted suicide, or the morning after pill, because the way it works, it actually interrupts the pregnancy. If it works, it's only at a 25% success rate. You'd never know that when people are pushing for it. It's such a great thing, you know. They did a study in England. They put it on the bedside of people, so they have it uh, handy and available, and they couldn't show that they'd actually change their pregnancy rates in the people who were using it. That's how ineffective it is. But if it did work, it would work by basically screwing up the hormones that support the pregnancy at the end. You know, you give a lot of doses of pills and then you drop it off and things drop off and that's one of the things that can cause a miscarriage. So one person wrote in, the doctor's right to stand up as a release and she basically said, that's the kind of doctor I want. Honor diversity essentially is what she's saying. Um, don't fire him. Next. And look at the size type. I actually tried to mimic the size of the type there. Doctors should follow OHSU policy. So you see the actual way that the intrusion of the press, the people who pick headlines, and there's actually layout people. Mm -hmm. And so he thought this one, they're exactly the same size in terms of their letter, but the headline was different. It just shows the majority of uh, doctors should follow OHSU policies. If you work for OHSU, you basically become um, uh, conscienceless. You, you, you follow, you, you park your integrity at the door. So I have some principles. These are the principles that you should take home. You want to expect your doctor to have. You want to do yourself with whether or practice. Some of you may be pharmacists, nurses, or have people in your family. These are the principles. Next. All human life is inherently valuable. It's a secular way of saying life is sacred. So it doesn't matter. It's exactly the same thing. You, you can use the language, be wise as a serpent, if you will, gentle as a dove, and you basically have to talk the language of the culture. We've actually had people fight us over this principle that is actually the ethic of Physicians for Compassionate Care. Uh, Dr. Benson and I have talked about this, and you know, if you get rid of this principle, because it sounds too pro-life, 
You have nothing. What's your principle then? You don't have one. So, guilty, you know? No one has a right to wrong. I, I uh, read about this. It was a very famous figure in our history who said this. It's not, he's not the first person who, but the way he said it was very clear. It was a Lincoln-Douglas debates, and Lincoln said it in 18, 1857 when he was debating Douglas. And um, my corollary, it's probably not mine, it's probably St. Uh, Thomas Aquinas is uh, next. Um, next. Oh, my corollary, I didn't tell you. It's uh, no one has a right to do wrong and no one has a right to help someone to do wrong. Because you are cooperating with the wrong, with the evil. Next. No one can serve two masters. I think I have that on pretty good authority. Um, you and your, your health professionals should be, you know, the people, you know where your doctor stands. You, you should be unabashed and advocating for patients' health and well-being, not prolonging, that's the word that's always used. I don't like that. I like to allow people to live fully until they die naturally. Prolonging is kind of a pejorative word by itself, isn't it? Mm -hmm. You know, you have a prolonged bowel movement, you know, so. <laughs> it's known as constipation, you know. I mean, it's, uh, you know, I, I've got a pr prolonged stay, at, and uh, it's prolonged labor, you know, see, these are not good things. Um, so you should be unabashed and advocating for your health and well-being from natural conception until natural death. You, you have to maintain your integrity in whatever you do. You know, I remember one of my, my former chairs um, saying to me, you know, because I was being too public about a lot of these things, and, you know, if you want to get promoted, you want to be on committees, you want to have appointments, you, you got to cut back or stop doing these things. And, I, I, you know, the, the spirit inspired me. I said, you know, no job is worth that. You know, you compromise who you are to, you know, nobody on her deathbed says, oh, I wish I wrote one more paper. I was the committee chair. <laughs> so that's my talk. What questions have I stirred in you all? Yes. Oh, yeah, so it's a very good question for those in the back. Basically, um, she is a nurse. She works in a place where there are not a lot of other people around and you're getting asked questions that are very challenging. Like I'm thinking about assisted suicide. I, what, do I, what do I tell people? Well, you know, I've actually had about two dozen cases like that in my own personal practice, and so it is challenging. So the first thing I say to people when I ask, you know, well, tell me about that. What's going on? And in the very process of asking about what is the hurt, what is the fear that the person has, you start a therapeutic alliance with the person that you care about them. You're not interested in being a vending machine. Oh, you're interested in assisted suicide? Here, let me give you a brochure about how it's done. So it's an interesting thing. We, we're called Physicians for Compassionate Care. Dr. Benz and I and others, Ken Stevens, uh, Greg Hamilton, there are a lot of doctors who've stood up for truth, justice, and a traditional medical ethic. And the, the reality is that um, that process is critical. The alternative is the vending machine. If you, we call ourselves Physicians for Compassionate Care. What does the promoters of assisted suicide and euthanasia call themselves? Compassionate choices. So-called compassion and choices. And why do I use the word so-called? Because if I say, well, you want to die? Here, let me help you. You've been persistent in your wishes. I'm really being dispassionate about your request. Whether you live or die doesn't matter to me. One of the slides I used a week ago, two weeks ago in Georgetown was George Amy, and he is the executive director for so-called compassion and choices. And this woman, um, Lavette Swart, that's her name, you can look at OregonLive.com, she used to work for the Oregonian. She's already announced for months that she's going to end her life, holds up the violin videotapes and the Oregonian was collaborating with her in this presentation to like Brittany Maynard with selling assisted suicide. And at the last moment after she's had a polka, polka party literally in her apartment with her, with her friends, she's that vigorous, George Amy says, now you sure you want to go through with this? And she says, I'd really rather go on dancing. To which he says, you can. Well, no, I've already taken anti-emetic and I, I wanna go ahead and do this. Um, and she does. And he coaches her not to take it too fast because if you do, you, it's such a bitter tasting foul stuff. She said, this is the most God awful stuff I've ever tasted. That's her last words. And basically she drinks it over three minutes, which is what George suggested. But the closest person to her in her last moments of life is not her doctor, not her family members, 
not her best friends, the closest person geographically, physically in the room, because they show a still shot, is George Amy, a lawyer, executive director, promoting so-called compassion choices. What if he'd responded when she says, well, I'd really rather go on dancing. Well, gosh, Lavelle, if you've got this thing, I really don't think you should do this. I, I like you to go on dancing, too. You know, in relating to you over this time, you know, I know you've said you want to do this, but I really like talking to you. You're important to me. Don't do this. Now, is it, well, you can. Is that compassion? Or is it my little effort to try to say how I respond to people? And, and it's universally, I've never had somebody not respond to that. I, I've even taken care of board members of the so-called Compassion and Choices. And, and literally, I was on call when one was admitted. And we had these conversations, and she didn't end her life while she was on my service. And, and, and the family members who literally, when I asked them at the foot of the bed, the daughter, because we'd taken care of this, we'd stabilized her heart problems, the daughter at the end of the bed, she would not answer the question, how do you feel about your mother's taking her life? I say, well, it's her choice. It took me three times of, so I know you're, you're respecting her choice, that's what you're saying, I've got that message. I ask you how you feel about it. Finally, she says, well, I don't want her to do it. To which time the person who's at the head of the bed, she says, gets a scowl on her face and says, and I said, I could see both of them, because I was at the angle, I could see them both. I, said, I, I know you don't like it when your daughter said that, because you're strongly independent, you want other people not dictating your choices, right? And she smiles, with a smile of recognition you get on a child. I said, but you know why she said that, don't you? And she smiled again. She says, yes, because she loves me. So who responds with the compassion and who's dispassionate? Who's a vending machine? Whatever knob you pull is fine with me. And who cares about the continued existence of this person? We're not islands. How we respond to each other is critical. So it's not an accident that two dozen people have asked me. Nobody's gotten mad at me. I did this with one person who I never saw before or after the one urgent care visit, and he was a guy with advanced multiple sclerosis. And I learned enough because the, the thing to take care of was an upper respiratory, it's pretty easy. So I spent another 10 minutes with him just talking about his life. He had a 17-year-old daughter. I found he was a successful contractor despite the wheelchair. I said, you know, this is really remarkable. You're, a, you're more productive than I am, and you don't have the use of your legs. He says, well, yeah, but it's hard. I said, yeah, it must be getting across construction sites and, you know, dependent on a wheelchair. And he says, yeah, it is, you know, and I've got this, it gets me down sometimes, and if it gets too bad, I'm just thinking I might want to end it all. I might use that assisted suicide. And I said, well, you know, we talked a little bit more. I said, you know, I'm really glad you, you told me that. I wouldn't know how it is. You've, you've helped me to understand a little bit more like your life is. But I, can I tell you something? And he said, yeah. And I said, well, I want you to know that I really enjoyed getting to know you, and I want you to know if you were my patient, if I were your doctor, I would take care of you. I would not want to ever abandon you. I'd want to help you with whatever disability you have, but I want you to know that um, if you wanted to end your life, I wouldn't help you with that because that's something that I, I'm not going to do. Your life's too important to me, even if you feel like that. And I think if your 17-year-old daughter were here with me today, I think she'd say the same thing. And he said, thank you. He said, thank you. So how we respond to each other is critical. And unfortunately, the culture has become, I'm imposing my values. I, yes, I am. <laughs> I think you're valuable. 